Good evening and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. I'm Jonathan Earle, Director of, uh, Associate Director of Programming. More people on this side than that side tonight. For some, okay, maybe that's what it is. Welcome to the final evening program in the Dole Institute's 2005-2006 academic year. It's been an exciting year for all of us at the Institute, one that brought to this lectern speakers as fascinating and diverse as Nobel laureate Lech Wałęsa, Bush Cheney campaign strategist Matthew Dowd, Chairman of the Pakistani Senate, Mahad Medmian Somru, Senators Carol Mosley Braun and Tom Daschle, and just three weeks ago, the first commander of the Multinational Security Transition Command in Iraq, Lieutenant General David Petraeus. And that's leaving out more than a dozen other programs we had here this year. In addition to the high quality programs, we take great pride in the mature and civil atmosphere that tends to reign here at the Dole Institute, even when we feature controversial speakers. I don't know, maybe it's this building or this room with its focus on public service. So for tonight and for all of our public programs, please remember that the Dole Institute encourages vigorous questioning and give and take, but we also require courteous and civil treatment of all points of view. At the conclusion of tonight's formal program, our guest has agreed to take questions from you, the audience. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and wait for one of our staffers to bring you a cordless microphone. So we can get to as many questions as possible. Please ask only one question, and as always, no speeches. Introducing tonight's guest will be Dole Institute Director Bill Lacey. When he arrived on campus in the fall of 2004, he promised to offer more public programs than in the Institute's first year, and to bring more political practitioners to complement the big names of our signature programs. Singles and doubles, as opposed to the occasional home run, in his words. I think you'll all agree he's made very good on his promise. We've also had our share of ground rule doubles, stand-up triples, and even the occasional suicide squeeze. That's why it's so fun to work here. Please welcome our skipper, Bill Lacey. You can expect a baseball analogy from a New York Yankees fan. So, but thank you very much, John. That's very kind. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Thanks to the College Republicans for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, I want all the College Republicans who are with us tonight to please stand up. Stand up, guys. Great. Tonight's topic is very important in light of the increasing number of corporate scandals we view most days on the evening news. Our guest tonight attracts a lot of attention. I'm willing to bet that most of you know something about our Attorney General, and I suspect that some of you even already have an opinion about him. Let me share a few things about Phil Klein, though, that you may not know. He was born in Kansas City, Kansas, less than nine miles from where his great-great-grandfather settled in 1870. He is one of five children raised by a single mom. He attended Central Missouri State on a wrestling scholarship. That's why he's so competitive, I think, and graduated from KU Law in 1987. And he served four terms in the Kansas House. As Attorney General, you probably don't know this about Attorney General Klein. He enabled the, his action has enabled the creation of a $100 million foundation that now provides health care to poor and indigent Kansans by initiating a lawsuit in 2003. He sued a Florida pharmaceutical company that had raised the price of flu vaccine by over 1,000% during the 2004 flu vaccine shortage. He sued Shell Oil for artificially inflating their oil reserves, which led in, uh, misled investors and hurt Kansas retirees. He wrote and lobbied for the bill that doubled the sentences for rape. Uh, he's recovered 14% greater water flow from Arkansas River in a lawsuit against the state of Colorado and 30% more water flow from the Republican River by winning a lawsuit against the state of Nebraska. 
and all of you from Kansas know the importance of water in Kansas. Last year, he was unanimously elected president of the Midwest Association of Attorneys General by his peers, all five Democrats and five Republicans unanimously. Tonight, he'll share his approach to corporate investigations. Please welcome Attorney General Phil Klein. It's my honor to be here, and I appreciate the leadership of the Dole Institute and its mission to foster reasoned and rational dialogue about significant issues that face us all. And so I'd like to thank Bill and those who support the Dole Institute and the University of Kansas for what you bring to Kansas, and the College Republicans for co-sponsoring this evening. People try to figure out what to call me. I still remember the first time I had the honor of being called Attorney General. It was January 13th, 2000, Inauguration Day. Anybody from Southeast Kansas? Nobody? You, from, you know, Bill Curtis on the A&E channel, he's from Southeast Kansas. And he was the MC. He has a wonderful voice. And he introduced the governor and the first gentleman. Were going, they were going down the south steps. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, the 41st Attorney General of the great state of Kansas, Phil Klein and his lovely wife, Deborah. And Deborah leaned over to me and said, just remember, in our house, that rank is already taken. So you can call me Phil. One of the things that I believe has set aside America from other nations throughout human history and truly on the face of the globe today is the rule of law. The belief that the law, fashioned through vigorous legislative give and take and debate and national input and discourse and constrained by principles that reflect truth that are articulated in the Constitution and applied equally to all citizens, protects liberty, provides hope for tomorrow, allows for the application of skills and energy to build a better tomorrow for oneself, one's family, one's community is vital to society. That belief reflected in action is truly probably not present in over 50% of the globe today and throughout human history has rarely been present. And so what is the role of an attorney general in this society in which the rule of law is supposed to be applied, where those of power who might violate that rule should face justice, where the weakest among us should have the protection of the law, where the law must be applied? It's a raging debate among our nation's attorneys general. And I stand on one side of the chasm, and some of my colleagues, who I deeply respect, stand on the other. To kind of put this into context, I want to take you back to my first meeting of the Association of Attorneys General. As you know, there are 50 of us. And the meeting was in Florida. And I was pretty high on the hog at that time. I just won the election. My chest was kind of puffed up. It was neat. I was one of a club of 50. And we gathered in this room, and they had us all seated around in the square, and we each had a microphone, which is a dangerous thing to do with politician lawyers. And it took them a while to calm us all down. And then we had the first presentation of the conference. I was excited to hear about this. And so I was expectantly waiting to see what wisdom could be imparted to me as the newly elected Attorney General of Kansas to help me do my job. And I proceeded to listen and learn for two hours about the molecular structure of trans fats. Somewhat fascinating. I, I learned that trans fats were a part of ho-hos. I was addicted to ho-hos when I was in college. I still remember when they went from 12 to 10 in the box and kept the price the same. If I had been a trial attorney at that time, I would have owned ho-hos hostess for the injustice that they had visited upon me. But I learned all about trans fats. And I was thinking this whole time, I wasn't elected state nutritionist. 
Why am I here listening to this? Well, then the next speaker went to the podium and said, I am here to introduce you to the greatest threat facing America today. And I can't wait for the picture of Osama. Something that deals with my role as Attorney General. And he said, obesity. And that is why we as Attorney Generals have to bind together and sue the fast food industry for grabbing us by the scruff of our necks, dragging us through the drive throughs and force-feeding us these trans fats. Now, you might think obesity is a problem. I understand it is a health concern. I understand that legislators are now debating, schools are debating, should we have, by the way, the cake was very good. Thank you. <laughs> should we have this on campus? Should we have this in schools? It is a vigorous debate, and I appreciate that. Although it does call into question a little bit about the concept of liberty, but at least the debate is taking place in our society, and you have input. But as Attorney General, in a courtroom, with a lawsuit? Unlike what you might have read or heard about me, I actually did attend law school. And it was at the University of Kansas, and I did make some of the classes. And I remember in going to law school that before somebody could recover in law, in a court of law, with a lawsuit, there were three requirements that had to be met in tort law. Three requirements. I like to call these requirements the pillars of Western jurisprudence. They were the things that were erected that promoted some concepts that were very foundational to the idea of liberty. Something called self-responsibility. You see, the concept of self-responsibility says that I cannot visit upon you the consequences of my choice. That it is my responsibility how I lead my life and exercise my liberty and freedom. That concept is important because, you see, if you study the economies and, and world governments throughout history, you will see that a lot of the struggle is trying to visit the consequences of somebody's actions, generally the powerful, upon those with less power. And in fact, our government, when it was erected, said, there's just something entirely different here. Government's not there for the powerful to force their issues upon somebody. It is there to protect inherent rights that are with all of us. So government must be very constrained in the exercise of its authority. And as it relates to our court system, the belief that people ought to have the opportunity to build a business for their family, to apply their skills and talents, to provide a needed product or service, because you know what? Businesses that don't provide what people want don't stay in business. Ought to have some rules of law that protect them from somebody arbitrarily taking away the fruits of their labor. Otherwise, people will be afraid to apply their talents and energies to build a better tomorrow for their family. And as a result, all of us will be impoverished. I was in South Korea. I went there on a um, young political leadership group. There were some legislators from around the nation. I was in the state legislature at the time. And they took us around Korea. And we met with government officials. And we met with legal officials. And I still remember some of the discussion because Korea was in a fascinating effort of reform. Government had picked certain corporate favorites and had given those favorites certain rules that benefited them while denying some of their competitors. And they were trying to get away from that because foreign investors were afraid to invest in Korea. And that investment was essential to building their economy to provide economic opportunity for everybody. But they were afraid because they were afraid the government was arbitrary. And if they didn't invest in the right company that was favored by the, the, the government, that their investment might be lost, either nationalized or taxed, or the rules of the game might change. And so they were trying to establish the rule of law. It's quite fascinating because I remember talking, they have a unicameral legislature. And i got to tell you this story. You might think politics is tough in Kansas today. In Korea, 
Soon before I was there, there was a cabinet official. Their cabinet officials, the president, sat on their unicameral legislature floor. One of the cabinet secretaries, a bill that he wanted, failed. So he stood up and tried to commit suicide and stabbed himself. And once they had carried him out of the chamber and given him medical attention, the legislature cited him for contempt for delaying the proceedings. <laughs> They're tough in Korea. But in meeting a lot of these political candidates, I, I asked them, you know, what would you do before you ran for Congress or before you were in Congress? And they'd say, well, I, I was in jail. Interesting qualification. Okay. But I was too afraid to query further. Well, about third or fourth time, I finally said, now, wait a minute. A lot of you guys were in jail. What's the deal? Well, if you lose an election in Korea, good chance you're going to go to jail. Because there was the arbitrary application of the law. Their courts were very results and political minded and tended to impose results based upon their desires rather than the principles of the law. They were working very hard to reinstate a concept of legal principles that went beyond the personal desires of those who took an oath to uphold those principles. It was real interesting to see. And so now I'm back here in America and I'm thinking, okay, those three pillars of jurisprudence, those three pillars that said that there's going to be a rule of law in the marketplace, those three pillars that say that self-responsibility is important so individual initiative can flourish. Those three pillars are, before you recover in a lawsuit, you had to prove that somebody did something wrong. Now, isn't that important? That before you're able to win in a court of law, you have to show that the party who was hailed before the court, who is standing there as the defendant, did something wrong. I think that's an elemental concept of liberty. Not to take away liberty or the fruits of liberty, without showing somebody did something wrong. That wrong in a tort concept of law is either negligence, that is a legitimate claim to make against somebody, that they were negligent, that they behaved in a way where it was foreseeable that harm might occur. Negligence. Or intentionality. They intended to cause harm or recklessness. Those three concepts are critical to the concept of tort law and justice in the courtroom. Another one was that that action, that wrongful conduct, caused a harm. There had to be causation. If I kick out this, I won't do it, by the way, so nobody tackle me or anything. If I kick out the back of this, I caused a harm to the Dole Institute. But unless you're investing here, I might not have caused a harm to you unless you claim emotional distress by witnessing me doing. I had to cause a harm by my action before I could recover. And that harm was measurable in economic terms so that damages could be imposed on the defendant. Culpability, causation, damages. None have to be proven today. And that has occurred because we have courts that have forgotten their role. We have attorneys general that have learned the power of the bully pulpit. We have a media that is myopic in its focus. And we have a legislative body. And in some instances of people who don't understand the role of government. Let me give you an example of the legislative process. My mom raised us, and I think this is how I got my interest in politics, quite frankly, and the law. My mom raised five of us on her own, starting a small business. She worked harder than any human being, unbelievably hard, and was successful in being able to raise us and provide for her family. Her number one obstacle and competitor to her success generally was government which I found kind of interesting because government needs to be in partnership in helping people achieve their goals, not to be an obstacle or a competitor. 
And so I was kind of raised in that environment. When I was in eighth grade, my mom had a, had a government regulator visit her and write her up on something that I did not think was rational, but she couldn't afford an attorney. And so she said, hey, Phil, you're going to the law library and you're going to start learning the law. You've got to represent me. If you ever met my mom, you know why I ended up in eighth grade in the law library. Pretty tough bird. And so I kind of had this interest, and I got elected to the legislature. And I still remember one of my first committees. It was the Rule and Regulation Committee. Have any of you ever heard of the, you, do you know what they do? The Rule and Regulation Committee reviews the rules and regs that state agency apply to business. And one of the first group that came before us was the barbering board. Do we have any barbers in here? Or cosmetologists? Okay, I'm not telling this story to offend you. I'm telling this story to demonstrate to you when government loses its, its way, how it can cause injustice. Barbering board comes in, and they have a stack of regulations this high on barbers. Everything from, I love this one, I think they'd have to reorder the universe and have a conversation with God. No dust on an exposed surface. Two, exactly what you have to wear, you can't have a ketchup stain on your shirt, or they can take your livelihood away from you. And so I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, oh, geez. And I'm trying to get the chairman's attention. You know, I'm a freshman. They're not going to pay attention. Finally, I was so insistent. I represent a client. What do you guys say? So I looked at the guy. I said, why? What do you think they said? This is a polite crowd. What do you think they said? That's it. To protect you. So I said, how many people died from a haircut in Kansas? I mean, I know some people who thought they had died, right? I mean, let me ask you. Before you sit down and get your hair cut, do you say, let me see, Mr. Barber, your state license, because I don't have faith that you're safe until I know the state has been here. No. And if you have a bad hair day, you don't go back. So why do you think they do it? I did a little study. I went back to 1950. And I researched how much it would cost a woman whose husband left her or died without insurance, who didn't have a work history because he was the breadwinner, to start her own hair cutting business. You know, maybe she had done it on the side for friends, but it hadn't been a business enterprise. She had two children she needed to provide for. What would it take for her to get started in 1950? It was a couple hundred bucks was the answer. A pair of scissors, some flyers. She does a good job. People come. Opportunity. America! What do you think it costs her today? Thirty-five to $50,000. It's more than inflation. Because you see, she can't start her business right away. She's got to go to school to learn to do something she already knows how to do. That's a year to 18 months of deferred income. She can't do it in her home. It's considered a health hazard. She has to lease a facility. And then she has to have the safety inspections, the annual continuing education. Single woman walks into the bank. Mr. Banker, I don't have any collateral. My husband died. He didn't have insurance. I don't have work history. I don't have an income. But I've got a dream. I need thirty-five dollars to $50,000 to start a business 18 months from now. Not a chance. So why have we denied that opportunity? It's real simple. Government has become about the belief that democracy is inherently virtuous. Democracy is two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for dinner. If there's not virtue in the equation, and that virtue is reflected in the rule of law and the bill of rights, you see what's happened is that a majority of those sometimes who serve in government believe that if I get 10 phone calls for and four against, I'm for. Until I get 15 against, then I'm against. Until I get 25 for and then I'm for. And the awesome power of government is placed on the auction block to the highest bidder and those who make the most noise. 
And you see, the barbers support the regulation. Why? Because it professionalizes a trade and it erects barriers that prevent others from getting in and makes their market more secure. And barbers talk to a lot of voters. And so when you're considering the regulations, you get the phone calls. Oh, Mr. Klein, Representative Klein, we need these regulations. Got to keep the public safe. You tally 25 phone calls for it. Do you think the woman who doesn't know her husband's going to die and doesn't know she's going to need her skill to provide for her family has formed a political action committee to raise campaign contributions to give to political persons so they protect the freedom she doesn't even know she's going to need? We get zero phone calls against. And liberty is lost. How does that apply on the stage of attorney general? Well, I respect the law, first of all. A lot of times what we say gets taken out of context, so I have to put this disclaimer before you because there will be and already have been some who have taken it out of context. When corporate America violates the law, I'm in their face. If there's a violation of the law, I am aggressive and relentless. I recently sued one of the largest corporations in the world, and they have attorneys raining on my head. They rein in billions of dollars a year. My annual state general fund budget is about $4 million. It's BP Shell. And I firmly believe that we have evidence that justifies this lawsuit, that they intentionally under or overestimated their oil reserves in order to get better stock prices. And when the truth came out, the stock plummeted and retirees were hurt. But I didn't send out a news release saying that I was investigating BP Shell. Because as soon as I do that, I harm a reputational interest of somebody that I do not have enough information on to be, able, to be convinced that I ought to file a lawsuit. And I could be wrong. And you know what that news release does to a publicly traded company? It dumps their stock price. And the very fact that I am investigating hurts the retirees that I might be trying to help. But it gives me a darn good political story to talk about. And unfortunately, what we're seeing more and more is press release litigation by attorneys general. Mr. Spitzer of New York and I don't see eye to eye on some issues. But on every major case that he has had, I have to tell you, he has not won in a court of law, yet. He's gotten settlements. Let me tell you how the settlements occur. One of my colleagues came to me and said, you know, Phil, you've heard about these uh, Australian lotteries. By the way, do we have any winners of the Australian lottery here? All of you are. You're getting those emails. I know you are. It's like helping the Nigerian person, you know, you're getting those emails. You've won the Australian lottery, you just won 10 million bucks. All you got to do is wire a thousand bucks to me in Australia, I'll take care of the taxes and the transfer fees and your check's going to show up tomorrow. And they target Kansans because we're aging, everybody is I guess, but in our rural areas and they're more isolated and we're trusting, we're trusting people. You've heard, your word is your bond. And so, Kansans were getting these, as were others, and one of my Democratic colleagues came to me and said, we got to sue. I said, well, I'd like to stop this scam. What do, what do you got in mind? Well, we have to sue Data One. Data One doing the Australian lottery? You see, Data One recently purchased Western Union. And when somebody wires money in the scam, they use Western Union to wire the money. Now, of course, the person asking for the wire doesn't know they're being scammed, which means Western Union, who wires millions of wire transfers every day in America providing a needed consumer benefit, doesn't know that the person asking for the wire is being scammed. But Western Union was purchased by Data One, and Data One's on the stock exchange. We announce it, it'll hit their stock. And they'll want to settle. I said, what'd they do wrong? Wasn't a part of the discussion. 
I refused to participate. That one was sued. Actually, it wasn't sued. There was an announcement that a lawsuit was being contemplated. Data One settled within 30 days for $8 million. That $8 million was given to the AARP by the attorneys general who participated. Say what a good job the attorneys general are doing in protecting seniors. Let me tell you how I handled it in Kansas. I went to the Kansas Bankers Association. I said, we got a problem. We got seniors being scammed. And we also work, interestingly enough, the jurisdiction in this, in this issue is with the Secret Service. We try to bring to justice those who participate in those scams. But I went to the Bankers Association and I said, look, we got some people being scammed and I need your help. Let's produce a training video for your tellers to educate them about the warnings of these scams. So that when Emma comes to the bank and says, I won! Your teller can say, let's call the AG first, and let's see if this is for real. And we're stopping it before it happens. It's a different philosophy about how you approach these things. And right now, for example, we have 168 district court judges in Kansas, and good people all. But that debate is also raging in the courtroom. I like to ask judges, what do you think their role is? What do you think your role is in a courtroom? Generally, the answer is fairness. How many of you believe in fairness? It's a good thing. It's a good word. I like the word. You know, it's been mentioned to me ever since I could speak in school. You need to be fair. And fairness is an appropriate role of the court as it relates to access to the court, the rules of evidence, hearing the parties, everybody playing by the same rules. But fairness in result is not the judge's calling. Because each judge has an individualized and many times subjective definition as to what is fair. And we have literally thousands of court jurisdictions in this nation. And because of the various definition by judges of what is fair, people go forum shopping to find the right judge to get the definition of fairness that they might agree to. And to get out of the courtroom of the judge who might have a different definition of fairness. And as a result, we have an arbitrary application of power where those who are able to pick and choose where they sue have greater power than those who do not. And furthermore, as I understood, the definition of fairness, as it applies to governance, is enshrined in a constitution that you have the power to change, but rarely changes. And that the debate of fairness, as it relates to our own civil discourse and how we relate to one another on a daily basis, oftentimes, is defined in a legislature. Well, guess what? You can bring about changes all the time. You know where that power is. If you don't like what's happening, what do you do? You throw the bums out. You have that ability. You run yourself. You engage the debate. You try to change the laws. You do a petition drive. You do a march. Do any of you, in a litigation matter involving other parties, have the right to walk in the courtroom and tell the judge what your thought of fairness is? No, you'd be held in contempt of court. You'd be tossed out on your ear. Because the judges are supposed to apply the law to the facts, not their personal proclivities to an aimed result. Profoundly different. Another area where this is causing some mischief, believe me, I understand the need for law in these areas. I brought the first criminal environmental case in the state of Kansas by the Attorney General's office about two years ago in southeast Kansas for illegal dumping. But did you know there are now over 400,000 federal regulations, environmental regulations for which somebody who doesn't even know what occurred, who didn't have personal control over what occurred, could be held criminally responsible 
for what occurred. Now think about that for a second. Sometimes strict liability environmental law against corporations is important because they have, one, benefited from the harm, and secondly, they have generally the wealth to repair the harm. But this is not strict civil liability. This is not you must pay to clean it up. This is you go to prison. Think about that with the concept of liberty. Sending someone to prison for something they did not know happened, for which they had no control, and in which they did not participate. Does that present a civil liberties issue? Ah, not to the media in America, because it's so easy to beat up on corporate America. All you got to do is say they're evil, and nobody will raise a voice. Again, if a corporation does wrong, I'm there. But does it not cause you to pause when we can put somebody in prison when they had no involvement in the so-called wrongdoing? And this erosion of some of the foundational concepts of liberty rule of law, the concept of self-responsibility present a great challenge to America. And I appreciate the opportunity to dialogue with you about that challenge. With that, I'd be glad to respond to questions. Thank you, uh, Attorney General Klein, for coming tonight. My question is... I'll repeat the question so people can hear. the concept of self-responsibility um, will start to come into effect with, um, do you want me to repeat my question? Yeah, if you would. Okay. Um, our generation has had a lot of information about the effects and the dangers of smoking, and throughout our entire lifetime, there's been the Surgeon General's warning on the side of cigarette boxes. And it seems that um, maybe by the time that our generation is, you know, facing the, the really bad effects of smoking like cancer that may, do you think that the, the government will stop allowing the lawsuits to happen against the tobacco industry because of the concept of self-responsibility that you discussed? Interesting question. And let me, let me first say, I think the education that has occurred regarding the harm that can occur because certain activity is, is very helpful. Government's general choice is to try to alter behavior through a couple of ways. One is to outright ban it, like is done with narcotics, illegal narcotics. Another is to try to tax something, to try to coerce you or invite you to spend your resources elsewhere. And that's happened with tobacco, with the raising of taxes. Here's my concern as it relates to the lawsuit that was generated by government against big tobacco. First of all, the claim was big tobacco deceived by intentionally refusing to release information that indicated the addictive nature of nicotine. Now let's assume that is true. Let's say tobacco committed that harm, okay? And it's still somewhat being debated, but I think that there are a lot of people who believe that the evidence indicates that there was some knowledge of the addictive and harmful nature of tobacco to the tobacco companies and they concealed it. Who was harmed by that action? It's the person with esophageal cancer. 
It's the person who died from cancer in their family, who was harmed by it, who sued government. And at first, they threatened the industry with regulatory extinction. In other words, legislatively, they said that they are going to ban tobacco unless they settled the lawsuit. They settled the lawsuit. Who got the money? Did the person with esophageal cancer get the money? No. Government got the money. And in fact, you know, some of these lawsuits are continuing against big tobacco. And guess what the tobacco companies call us to do now as a partner in the settlement in which we get the money? To help defend them against the individual suing them because if they prevail, it will harm the revenue train to government. <laughs> and in fact, I was the only attorney general in the nation that refused to sign on with big tobacco in order to protect their settlement, which essentially secured them the marketplace because it taxes the non-participants in the settlement. And if those non-participants in the settlement, other tobacco companies that weren't part of the lawsuit, don't pay those taxes on time, they wanted to pass a law in Congress that said that if a common carrier like Federal Express or UPS was carrying their cigarettes to transport them across Kansas, that the driver and the company could be held criminally responsible for carrying non-participating manufacturer cigarettes when they hadn't fully paid what is technically called their escrow payment. They have asked me to join in lawsuits in Illinois to try to reverse a judge's decision awarding damages to an individual smoker. See, when we address these social issues, it's important that we do it in the framework of understanding the proper role of the various branches of government and our responsibility in that. There is a debate. I would differ. I don't believe we ought to ban tobacco. I tend to side on the concept of freedom. But there is a legitimate debate about that. Debated in the legislature. But for government to threaten an industry with regulatory extinction in order to extract a settlement so that it can pay through the judicial branch back to the legislative branch money while denying the harmed party the opportunity to sue is not consistent with my concept of government. on oh yeah hey, you, you got it excellent um, Bill I think there's a quote you might like um, and I don't mean to be insulting but I think I do need to bring it up that uh, don't bother me with the facts I've already got my mind made up I mean there's a lot of facts you left out especially about the tobacco legislation that a lot of the reason that people are educated or legislation I'm sorry the, the lawsuits the reason people are educated about the harms of tobacco is because of those lawsuits so that's one of those things where lawsuits did well but I just had a question about how um, your point of view reconciles with some of, I, I poured through your press releases last night and I printed some of my favorites, but there was a lot of stuff in your press releases where it seems like you're doing your own litigating by press release. Um, you're talking in some press releases, you rail on John Edwards for his medical plan. You uh, are talking about filing amicus briefs for abortion rulings. You issued a one sentence statement about the Supreme Court's ruling on the Ten Commandments at the courthouse. And uh, I hope I don't have to remind you that if we just go ahead and go with what the will of the majority goes, we no longer become a, a nation of laws, but a, law, a nation of men. And that part of this separation of, of uh, governments, of the judicial and the legislative, keeps us in a nation of laws. And we should respect the rulings of the courts. But I just want to hear your comments about how you reconcile what I see in reading your press releases. And if you want them, I've got them here as your own litigating by press release. And I also want to tell you that I really like you. I like all my Republican friends. I just disagree with you. I don't, I don't take political discourse personally. I would have died of grief a long time ago. Um, first, it, it wasn't the tobacco lawsuits that educated people about the harms of tobacco. I don't believe. The state receives about $40 million a year, and hardly any or none of that goes to tobacco cessation. 
it all falls into the general fund and goes to other areas. Um, for a long time, the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, the Surgeon General, uh, educational community has educated people about the harmful nature of tobacco, and certain legislation has required warnings. But it hasn't been the tobacco litigation which has provided state governments. Secondly, the comments, and you might have others that you're referring to, were active pieces of litigation. I do believe our Constitution allows the Ten Commandments to be posted. In fact, the Ten Commandments were a radical statement at the time that really goes in line with the development of Western jurisprudence that put the value of an individual above the value of property. At the time in ancient Israel and in the cultures around them, property was valued more importantly than the individual. And so certain thefts against persons might have resulted in the death penalty while the killing of an impoverished individual might not have resulted in any penalty. So it was a dramatic statement about the inherent rights of the individual. Now, you go to our Supreme Court, as I have, and argue before the Supreme Court, as I have. You are inspired by the great lawmakers of all cultures that are reflected in stone and paintings around that courtroom, including Moses. It is amazing to me that in a culture of tolerance, we cannot tolerate Judeo-Christian ethics. In a culture of acceptance, certain things frighten us. I'm not offended or frightened by the Koran. I'm not offended or frightened by the pagan. I'm not confused or limited by their expression of their faith. And so I don't have a problem with the posting of the Ten Commandments. And by the way, there is a great debate, and this debate touches on it, which is a fascinating discussion about how living and breathing our Constitution should be. Is it what it said at the time, or is it what we think it should say today? Fascinating discussion. Vibrant intellectual discussion that shouldn't be cheapened by simple explanations. And it is alive in our Supreme Court. In my recent argument before the United States Supreme Court, I was before two justices who are interpreting the, interpreting the Eighth Amendment of the United States Constitution, which is the prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment, by looking to international jurisprudence and law. To some legal scholars, that presents a very challenging and, in fact, they believe, wrongful approach to interpreting that document. So I kind of deviated into that discussion, but it is a fascinating discussion as it relates to the Ten Commandments because I know historically no one can claim that our Constitution prohibited its display. If you could wait for a microphone, that way they can get you recorded. Uh, Mr. Spitzer, am I on? Yeah, you're on. I, can, I can't hear my own feedback. Uh, you touched on a, a little area and opened up a little window about which I'm quite curious, and that's the whole national picture. And I wonder if you could take the time for us, at least for me, at li uh, <laughs> and I, th I think some others may want to hear this, on what this whole nat national picture is. Now, you opened the little window when you started to talk about your differences with Elliot Spitzer. Yeah. Uh, where are all the attorneys general? What power do they have? Uh, when they meet as a national body, if they do, uh, how much power do they have? What, what can you do as a person, for example, to make it better for everybody concerned in the nation, et cetera? I mean, could you just elaborate and uh, Very, tell us a story? Did, did you all, were you able to hear the question? It's real interesting because most people don't have a clue what an attorney general does. And it, it's, it's because our authority has come about from differ, several different sources, through tradition, through common law. I actually, when I sued in Missouri, I sued Health Midwest because the Attorney General of Missouri was taking all those charitable assets over to Missouri, I relied on decisions that harken back to English common law. 
back to the 13th century to argue that I have what's called Psi Prey Authority, which is my ability to ensure that charitable dollars go to their intended purpose. But it's not in statute. It's in common law. I also have several statutory responsibilities. We have the Consumer Protection Division. And we have a consumer protection law that says that you cannot engage in unconscion unconscionable or deceptive acts against consumers, whether it's the car dealer lying or the flu vaccine guy gouging by raising his price a thousand percent when his costs did not go up. And then I have criminal law responsibilities as the chief law enforcement official in the state. I oversee a criminal division. We've had 40 homicide cases going on in the state. We're involved in, I've had over 700 cases of adult sexually exploiting children that I've either investigated or prosecuted since I've been Attorney General. Um, so that's part of the responsibility. In the various states, it differs. I have oversight of the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. So we, especially in the rural areas, and the smaller communities are the lead investigating agencies in serious crimes, as well as the lead prosecuting agency. Some attorneys general do not have that. And then there's this whole area of which we're speaking about tonight, where by the power of using the media, we could quite frankly get engaged in anything. My national association, we are discussing in a committee the different marketing tools that the liquor industry uses and whether they're caricatures or characters, whether they be animated or Hollywood personalities, appeal to young children. Because the attorneys general know by issuing a news release or demanding that the liquor industry alter their advertising, they will do so to avoid litigation by an attorney general. So you will see attorneys general involved in almost every facet of your life. And some of that is true because now courtrooms are involved. We're a very litigious society and every conflict we take to court. I had the honor, I had retained Ted Olson, the former Solicitor General of the United States, who represented Bush in the Bush-Gore, it was an unbelievable legal challenge. He's been before the U.S. Supreme Court on 46 occasions. He argued in an Indian gas tax case with me, and I helped him prepare, and that's what helped me prepare to argue my case before the U.S. Supreme Court. But he gives a speech you need to hear, in which he lists all of the issues that have been before the United States Supreme Court that were decided by one vote. Prayer in school. Posting of the Ten Commandments. Whether... Somebody who is handicapped can play in the U.S. Open. Women in country clubs. Prayer in prisons. Food that can be served during certain ceremonies or holidays. The list goes on and on. It's quite fascinating, and all of them were resolved in the United States Supreme Court by one vote. It's really a compelling speech, and it, it causes you to step back and reflect. Is that the forum? Now, certainly, as you brought up, Certain instances as it relates to the Constitution, if there is one standing against 299,999,999, that one has to be defended if it's a constitutional right. Because that's the Bill of Rights. We're not a mobocracy. We're a representative republic. So, but it's a vigorous and interesting debate. And I wish I could answer the question as it relates to the others. That's just generally an overview of my office and some of the things I, I spend most of my time on water, most of my time on various pieces of consumer protection and criminal prosecution. And all the media wants to talk about is abortion. Every, every issue that I have before me, the media says, well, how's that relate to abortion? Well, uh, we'll leave you alone then, Phil. Tell me when you got an abortion story to talk about. You mentioned a little earlier ago that you're concerned about results oriented judiciary and that it's up to the legislative branch we need to take a you know redress there but is the average citizen really equipped to understand how the changing of a statute the word may to shall or the impact that that can have in other words can, can we really compete against corporate lobbyists and 
So, so what protections, if it not for the Elliot Spitzer, notwithstanding any reasonable criticisms of his prancing and pruning, doesn't he in fact help pursue, not only protect consumers in New York State but around the country in sort of forcing corporate America to do what we can't force a legislature to do legislatively? Interesting question, and, and a legitimate one as well. Um, I, I would have two challenges to Elliot's approach. First of all, it depends how you, depends how you define consumer. You know, many of these corporations were owned by shareholders who were retirees who had pensions. And with the exceptions of the Enrons and the WorldComs and things like that, you did not see harm to them until the lawsuit was brought. Now that is legitimate if there is a wrongful act. That is legitimate. But the challenge, uh, there's a corollary challenge with using the courts to legislate a result that you can't get legislatively. And that is you can't change it. You see, when courts engage in constitutional analysis, they are writing decisions with stone and chisel. When legislatures engage in lawmaking, they write with pencil and eraser. Courts have made great mistakes throughout our nation's history. Dred Scott saying that a black was not a human being was a court decision that precipitated a civil war. And you can pick others. There are great court victories, but there are great court failures. And the final thing I'd say about your question is, can you compete? Oh, yes, you can. And I've seen it. I've seen the little guy prevail. I've seen the difference that they can make. I'll tell you what, legislators get scared out of the bejeebies when you generate petitions and phone calls. I remember when I was chairman of the tax committee, we were having a surplus of probably about 300 and some odd million dollars. Inflation was at 2%. Government revenues were growing at 12. I wanted to reduce the growth in government, not cut government, slow it down to about double the rate of inflation. Let's give the rest back to the taxpayer. And I initiated a proposal for the earned income tax credit in Kansas, a refundable one that helped the working poor, and also to have a homestead exemption in the property tax. So the first $50,000 of your home was not taxable. And the corporations in Kansas said, wait a minute, we want the mill levy reduced because one mill on a million dollar property is worth a lot of tax reduction. One mill on a $50,000 house is maybe five bucks. Well, we won by mobilizing individuals. You can do this. You can do this. The concern about legislating through the courtroom is you can't change the judges, you can't fix the result, and someday it might be you in there with somebody trying to legislate against you. We got to respect these various roles. I don't mean, and our time somewhat limits this, to say that everything that Elliot Spitzer has done is wrong. I'm saying that some of the approaches are wrong. And I'm not here to say that every legislature is right, but I'm here to say that you can fix it a lot easier. Um, you've had, uh, first, thanks for coming. Uh, it's, it's good to hear you speak. Thank you. Um, and, and second, you've had a lot of stories about uh, going against corporations and businesses. Do you have any stories about supporting them? Sure. Um, one of the stories that I told you is my refusal to participate in the Data One lawsuit. Um, I will not engage in that kind of effort. Uh, and that is the primary thing that I can do as Attorney General, is not to initiate action against a corporation that has done no wrong. I'm not in a position to forward legislation to support them or help them out, and I haven't done that. So it's, it's mainly in recognizing the authority of the office. You are a loyal fan wearing the Royals hat. How many have they got now? Seven? They've won seven? <laughs> Faithful. It's good.
Any other questions tonight for the Attorney General? They're between me and the hmm. door. <laughs> you can ask. Okay, well, Attorney General, thank you so very, very much for a wonderful <laughs> evening. Thank you, Jeff.